it's, it's filling I know up. it's not this an important part of the evening. I know, but yeah. this is great. Yeah, yeah. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mitsu Adams. I am the Student Center Administrator slash Director. Um, I will be reading the college's viewpoint, diverse viewpoint statement tonight. And I'd like to welcome you to Brooklyn College and to today's student club hosted event. Brooklyn College believes that the diversity of our student body is a valuable asset and a student-led events can be a critical part of preparing our students for future leadership and career success. Please note that all participants at any event on campus must be respectful of our diverse community and the viewpoints that are expressed. Disruptive behavior no of any sort will not be tolerated. We thank you in advance for your cooperation. Sarah? Good evening, everybody. My name is Sarah Ali. Um, I'm the president of Students for Justice in Palestine here at Brooklyn College. Um, before we start, <laughs> um, so before we start, um, we have Professor Barbara Winslow here. She'd like to read a statement on behalf of the Shirley Chisholm Project. Good evening, everybody. I'm so glad to see you all here. I'm Barbara Winslow. I'm the director of the Shirley Chisholm. I have a loud voice. Uh, director of the Shirley Chisholm Project of Brooklyn Women's Activism, and we are one of the group that has endorsed this event. And we're endorsing this event for many reasons. One, today is Shirley Chisholm Day at Brooklyn College, and this morning we had a, a room full of students and faculty to discuss not only Shirley Chisholm's legacy but the importance of the, what's going on in Ferguson, what it means to us in Brooklyn and throughout the world. Um, Shirley Chisholm, I think, would have been very supportive of this event. She was, one, a college professor, both at Mount Holyoke and at Spelman, and believed in justice for teachers. Two, she was a supporter of the Palestinian struggle. And to give you an idea of what a fierce, courageous, and gutsy woman this woman was, <laughs> When she was campaigning for the presidency in 1972, she was in Miami and asked questions about where she stood on the Israeli-Arab uh, question, and she said she stood with the Palestinians. Now, this is in 1972 and in Miami, of all places. She wasn't afraid, and she supported the Palestinian struggle because she believed in justice. Now, my other hat is I'm a professor in the Women and Gender Studies program here at Brooklyn College, and I am very proud to say, and I'm here with my colleague and friend and sister and comrade and compañera, Roz Pachewski, that at our National Women's uh, Studies Association conference, we enthusiastically uh, formed, a, I believe, formed a group, Feminists for Justice in uh, Palestine, and the undersigned members of the National Women's Studies Association endorsed the call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions issued by a broad coalition of Palestinian civil society in 2005. As feminist scholars, activists, teachers, and engaged intellectuals, we recognize the interconnectedness of the systemic forms of oppression, including genocide, slavery, racism, sexism, homophobia, class-based oppression, Islamophobia, ableism, ageism, and more and the transformative potential of resistance and solidarity in all our communities as well as across divides and borders. I don't want to read the whole resolution because it's very long, but I just want to say how honored I am to be able to say a few words and uh, to congratulate Brooklyn College and the students for uh, uh, justice for holding this meeting. And welcome to Brooklyn College, both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Okay, so I'm just going to give a brief introduction um, of the panel tonight. We have um, Professor Steven Salada. He's an associate professor of English at Virginia Tech. Um, he is the author of six books and writes frequently about Arab Americans, Palestine, Indigenous peoples, and decolonization. His current book project is entitled Images of Arabs and Muslims in the Age of Obama. Um, we also have Professor Catherine Frank tonight. She is the Isidore and Seville Soulsbacher Professor of Law at Columbia University. 
um, and she directs the Center for Gender and Sexuality Law. Um, and here to moderate the discussion tonight, we have um, Professor Corey Robin from um, the Political Science Department here at Brooklyn College. Um, and without any further ado, Corey, you can take over. Welcome, everybody. So, um, can you all hear me? We promised you a conversation, and we are going to have a conversation. Uh, we're not going to have formal presentations. We're just going to first have a discussion with our, our, our two guests, uh, and then we'll open it up to the floor. Um, so that's, that's how it's going to go. Um, so I wanted to really start by asking uh, Stephen, um, just in, you know, to introduce yourself to, to Brooklyn College, um, who you are, uh, where you're from, your family, and uh, where you went to school, um, and what you studied, and how you came to the interest that you have. Okay. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, first, uh, let me, let me um, uh, thank SJP for working so hard to, to put together this, um, this, uh, this fantastic event, and to, to, to Corey for... Um, to Corey for, for his organizational work on it and, and agreeing to moderate. Um, and, and really quickly, very quickly, uh, I, I, while, while I'm sharing a, you know, a, a, a table with them, I want to thank both, uh, publicly thank both uh, Catherine and Corey when they found out that, that I got fired. They understood immediately that it, it wasn't just about me, but about broader issues of academic freedom and, and faculty governance and uh, the uh, repression of, of Palestinian voices in academe and, and elsewhere. But even while they recognized those things and organized around those things, they, 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 they offered me um, um, personal support and, and, and friendship. And I, I, I just, I, I think that uh, uh, a sharp intellect and, and empathy make for an unstoppable combination. So, um, uh, well, I'm, uh, I was born in, in Appalachia, um, in a little town called Bluefield, um, to immigrant parents. My dad is um, from Jordan. Um, he's, he's what they would call a Jordanian Jordanian, you know, meaning a Jordanian not of Palestinian origin. And my mother is, a, is of Palestinian origin, but um, she was born and raised in Nicaragua. And so I have a, a something of an unusual um, background, and uh, you know, uh, I I've been working for for many years on on um, ethnic literature, um, indigenous studies, um, you know, um, um, American Indian studies. Uh, this is sort of the the, the broad cross section of, of 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 disciplines where where my work is 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 located and I think what what brings me um, here in to this to this particular spot in this particular moment in time is that uh, I, I you know I've recently become um, the subject of of, of, a, of a decent amount of, of, of conversation because uh, in in early August um, the the University of, of of Illinois um, um, terminated a, a, a contract for me to uh, join the faculty um, in less than a month as a tenured professor of American Indian Studies. Okay. So, um, as you said, you know, you you study. Uh, uh, I, I mean, I think one of the things that I've come to learn is is a field of what's called comparative indigen indigeneity. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your, I mean, I think people know you more at this point because of the case, but if you could talk a little bit about your intellectual interests, your academic work, what, mm -hmm. you know, what is that field? And um, uh, what led you to think about Native Americans and Palestinians in, in a comparative light? And what you think we gain by putting those, uh, uh, making that comparison? Okay. So if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure, of course. I, you know, that I, 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 I've always been interested in, 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 in Palestine. You know, that, that was kind of a topic of, of conversation in my household growing up. And I didn't, um, I, I didn't really develop any um, awareness of, of issues in, in, in um, American Indian nations until I took a course in college um, in, the, in the Native American novel. 
And one of the first things I, I realized when I took that course is that it was absolutely shameful that, that I had gone, um, you know, more than 20 years in the United States without a sense of, of indigenous peoples on the continent um, existing in contemporaneous spaces rather than as, as artifacts or relics trapped in, in, in the past and imagined, uh, you know, as, as a, as a uh, sort of token of, of American modernity. And, and there was no sense uh, that, that, that these um, communities were still living, still fighting for justice, still fighting for um, sovereignty, um, still fighting for the decolonization of their lands. Um, weren't interested in, in the traditional forms of assimilation that the, by, you know, the process by which we often are made to uh, uh, recognize the, the, the needs of, of ethnic minority communities. I didn't know that they don't generally consider themselves to be ethnic minority communities in the first place, that they consider themselves quite rightly to be nations right? Uh, nations with their own national histories and their own national aspirations. And, and very, very few Americans know these things, right? Uh, it, it, it tells you how the, it tells you how the, uh, the, the understanding of, of race and ethnicity in this country uh, often gets limited to uh, liberal discourses of, of multicultural belonging and doesn't talk about um, race and dispossession as, as s structural factors, right, uh, you know, in, in, in the fabric of American history. And so I, I recognized in, in a lot of these questions about native um, dispossession, uh, you know, Palestine. I recognized Palestine all, all over the place, and I recognized Palestine in two ways. One, um, I recognized um, um, some comparable conditions in the process of, of New World settlement, right, with, with the settlement of, of Palestine by Zionists starting in the late 19th century. But I also noticed Palestine as a symbol or an avatar, right, of, of, of the, the mentality or the imagination of many of the early American settlers, particularly the Puritans in, in, in the Northeast, their conceptualization of themselves as Israel in the wilderness, you know, fighting against, um, an, uh, you know, fighting against an, an Amalek that, that, that God wants them to, to either convert or slaughter. Right, and so they they were really uh, recapitulating uh, the some of the stories of, of the the book of, of 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 Joshua, and you know Cotton Mather's famous phrase is that uh, you know we have to uh, rid ourselves of, of this blight that is annoying this Israel in in the wilderness. All right, so the 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 land right in the eyes of the the the, the settler takes on this um, biblical connotation and, and biblical performance. And so ever since then, I've, I've been looking at the ways uh, that th these certain discourses of, 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 of settlement uh, have, have traveled back and forth across the Atlantic at different points in history. So, uh, you know, a quick question or follow-up on that, which is when your case kind of exploded, uh, it seemed very hard for people to understand you know, what is the connection? You know, you're in a native, uh, an American Indian Studies Department, but he talks about Palestine. You know, what is he? And there was this constant refusal to, to even consider what you just said, to even think about that. And I wonder if that's something you encounter a lot, or have encountered a lot, and, and what is that about? Why, why don't people want to think about these two stories, these two realities, in, 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 in comparative perspective? Okay, I think it depends a lot on on the politics of of the speaker. Um, I think a, a lot of folks um, don't don't want to think about Israel or the United States as colonial projects, right? I think that's the 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 first problem. But um, even beyond that, uh, there there was this uh, move to uh, su support the university's administration by uh, focusing on on. Uh, you know these 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 uh, made up procedural issues, such as you know you know this guy is not he works on Palestine, therefore he's not qualified to teach in American Indian studies, which is um, a rem a remarkable a remarkably dishonest claim to make because uh, 
you know, these these are folks who weren't on the search committee, right? <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't their choice to make, right? I don't even know what why the hell I got hired. I submitted an application. I went through the process. They offered me a job. I accepted it. We signed a contract. The end, right? I wasn't I wasn't sitting there with them when they were making their deliberations. And so, you know, everybody behind a, a keyboard has become an expert on on the hiring process the, to 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 which none of them has been privy. And and to and all of a sudden they become experts in American Indian studies. Right? <laughs> but that's the thing, though, right? See, it's not an accident, right? Because. There's, there's, there's a kind of a, a majoritarian sensibility that, that uh, is quick to render itself, right, uh, experts, right, on, on, on the lives and histories of, of Native Americans, right? They, you know, they're, they're ultimately in, 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 in control of, of a certain paradigm around what, what, it, what it means, right, to, uh, you know, to, uh, to be... Indian in in the modern world, if the Indian has even made it into the modern world in the first place, they're they're arbiters of of Indian identity, or they appropriate Indian identity, or I should say, to be more precise, an invented Indian identity, right? To uh to stake some sort of psychic uh, uh, connection to the land that they've colonized and that they yearn so deeply to become a part of, right? Um and and so they you know the. That's the first thing, right? The the, the, the profound dishonesty that, that, that goes into these questions about qualifications. But second of all, people don't appear to have much of an idea of the the way that the question of Palestine has in fact been taken up in recent years by American Indian and indigenous studies, right? It's It's been taken up for some of the reasons that, that I've mentioned, but also because of a growing recognition of the role uh, that Israel has traditionally played as a colonizing force, not in Palestine, right, but in uh, other parts of the world, particularly Central America, right? The, the role that, that Israel has played in, in, in training and, and funding uh, death squads in, in Guatemala, right? Read about Israel and, and, and you know, El Generalissimo Rios Mont, right? Uh, read about uh, Israel's relationship to the, um, you know, to the Contras. You know, read about um, Israel's relationship to the, uh, to the Salvadoran death squads, right? So there's, there's, there's sort of a growing understanding that when we think of, of the United States as, as a, a colonial presence, that, that, that we ought to think about... Uh, Israel, right, as 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 um, you know, as a as a corresponding presence that it's very difficult to separate into a distinctive category from 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 the U.S. So I want to move us a little bit now towards you know the your the situation at at the University of Illinois, and I want to I want us to bring us back to during the summer, and the Gaza war is going on, and I just want you to kind of recreate for us, if you can, you know, what, what was going on for you and what were you thinking about uh, as that was happening? Did this just seem more of the same to you? Just, you know, yeah. I mean, there was, um, there was, there was a, there was a, um, a, a pretty uh, profound sense of, of anguish and horror that, that, you know, I, I feel like I, I shared in common with, um, with, with, with a lot of people, right, online and offline. And, you know, a, a, a sense that, that there's nothing useful that we can do, you know, to uh, prevent the sort of abject uh, suffering that the, the people of Gaza were, were enduring. Um, the images were coming across our uh, social media feeds of, you know, of dead infants and, and, and toddlers. I kept um, seeing... Uh, Images of 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 children uh, being stored in an ice cream freezer because the uh, the morgues had run out of space, right? And and there was no electricity anyway, right? So the the bodies were going to decompose rapidly in 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 the summer's heat, um, you know. It's, uh, and and a sense that uh, a sense not only of of, of helplessness but um, but outrage the at the way this uh, slaughter was being covered in 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 corporate media. Right. You know, they keep focusing on reprisals and rockets and, and reprisals and rockets and who fired a rocket first. I don't give a damn who fired 
first. The point is, Israel displaced 700,000 people in 1948. That's what happened first, all right? Uh, that's what started it, um, you know, and, and this, this com complete lack of understanding of this very basic context of, of colonialism and the fact that the people of Gaza have been um, entrapped and, and confined and, and, you know, Israel's been, uh, you know, uh, mowing the lawn and putting them on a diet and, and doing all kinds of other horrible things to, to them for, 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 for years. And then uh, corporate media, you know, sort of treats it with, with this sense of, of equivalence. Right, you know, like Hamas and Israel exchanged fire. You know, it's as if uh, you know, there, you know, there, there's some uh, plane of, of equality on which the the, the two entities e e exist, and, and no understanding of, of the colonial framework, and no understanding. And this is a problem with 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 a lot of corporate media vis-a-vis um, -vis any any site of of, of conflict in in, in which uh, there there's. Uh, you know, in which there's dis disparate power among the participants. You see it in Ferguson. Um, you know, you see, see it in all kinds of places. But uh, see, they 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 talk about violence as as if violence is 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 something that happens in in self-contained moments or events, right? That that can be uh, identified and and categorized. But um, for the people of of, of Gaza, you know. Um, they endure continual violence, right? Everything about the conditions in which they live is violent. Everything about the military occupation of the West Bank is violent. And it's a constant violence. And it's not a violence you step off of the street from and shield yourself from and, and don't have to deal with anymore. So all of these things are, are, are on my mind. And, and, and you know, this is a, a you know, Twitter, you know, whatever it's, it's, its problems, it can also be a way of, of articulating viewpoints and being in conversation with, um, you know, with, um, with, with like-minded people. But um, it's, 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 it's also an appeal, too. You know, when something horrible is happening, it's, it's an appeal that, that somebody out there with, with some semblance of power do something to make this, this horrible, horrible thing stop. So... Uh, I want to ask you something that's, uh, I think it's on people's minds, and, I, and I, I feel like I have to, and I just want to read out some of the tweets sure. and ask you to talk a little bit about them. So, and uh, this is sort of a cross-section over a period of weeks and days. So, first one, let's cut to the chase. If you're defending Israel right now, you're an awful human being. Second one, if it's anti-Semitic, to deplore colonization, land theft, and child murder, then what choice does any person of conscience have? Three, you may be too refined to say it, but I'm not. I wish all the West Bank settlers would go missing. Fourth, Zionists, transforming anti-Semitism from something horrible into something honorable since 1948. And then last, I refuse to conceptualize Israel-Palestine as Jewish-Arab acrimony. I'm in solidarity with many Jews and in disagreement with many Arabs. Okay. Um, uh, uh, um, thank you. Uh, uh, well, I, you know, the, 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 you know, I'll start with the last one. It's, it's, it's a simple enough... Um, statement in, 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 in philosophical and moral opposition to, to ethno-nationalism, that we, we shouldn't choose our politics based on filiation or affiliation, that, that uh, there, there ought to be different sets of, of factors that, that, that play into our thinking and, and that might influence the, the direction um, in which we move. The other tweets, I, I feel like the second tweet about Zionists transforming anti-Semitism and, and the fourth tweet, if it's anti-Semitic to deplore colonization, land theft, and, and sort of go into one another. And see, uh, you know, tw Twitter, Twitter conversations uh, happen in, in, in I guess, uh, specific moments of, of, of time that come out of broader conversations. And so I was criticizing Israel and, you know, people are like filling up my mentions with accusations that, that I'm being anti-Semitic, right? And so those, those tweets are sort of response to it. And it's asking people quite simply to uh, examine the discourse they're using and to think it through. Now look, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not 
asking or, or expecting uh, folks to, to agree with me. There, there, there are people in this room. Um, there are people on this, you know, behind this table who know uh, a lot more about the, the history of, of anti-Semitism than I do. But I, I, I know enough about, uh, uh, you know, uh, closely examining a, a, a discourse, right, to know that conceptualizing criticism of the behavior of a nation state as anti-Semitism is not only a stupid thing to do, but it alters, at least tacitly, the meaning of anti-Semitism, right? And it ends up devaluing you know, the actual instances of anti-Semitism that still happen across the United States and, and all over the world. To me, it's, it's you know, I would say that as a, as a non-Jew, maybe it's not my place to, uh, to comment on, on uh, you know, on how Jewish folks should, uh, you know, should conceptualize and define notions of anti-Semitism. But as an Arab who is constantly being called anti-Semitic, it becomes my problem too, and it becomes a problem of, of all the Palestinians, right? Because it's m my sense that um, Palestinian Arab and, and Muslim Americans, um, you know, tend actually to be extremely careful about making distinctions between Jews and Zionists and uh, Jews and the state of Israel because they've spent so much time being implicated, right? Uh, as an entire group, right? Uh, you know, for for the acts of violence that 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 other people do. You know, so Boko Haram does something, and you know, all of a sudden, all all Muslims in the United States are implicated. We know that feeling, right? We 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 know that it's not a good idea to implicate um, an entire cultural group, right, in, into a political, you know, or to conflate it with a political action, right, or or, or form of violence. And so, it's 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 I, I see it as deeply problematic um, that 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 some supporters of, of Israel are invoking this particular rhetorical technique to shut down some of the much needed criticism of of of, of Israel and that to to uh, to you know to to uh, to sort of to to cast um, to cast uh, uh, you know, Israel as as the embodiment of of Jewish values or the Jewish people is ludicrous at a basic empirical level. It completely uh, it completely erases right the huge number of of Jews who are not Zionist right or who don't have any identification with the state of Israel one way or the other who just don't give a damn right um, you know and 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 it 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 also places this this kind of onus on on Israel right to to be perceived in 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 uh, in an exceptional manner as something godly and timeless that Zionists then uh then disavow right when Israel is criticized by saying well why, why don't you focus on China you know or or, or North Korea it's like, well you're the one who told us that it's special you're the one who told us it's better than everything else. You're the one who told us it's godly, all right? You're the one who made the place exceptional, right? Uh, so don't complain when we point out to you that, that the only exceptional thing about it from the point of view of, of Palestinians is the amount of killing it can do, right, while being completely absolved by the government of its main sponsor, the United States. Right, that's what we see as exceptional in Israel. Right, it's, it's certainly not uh, a moral exceptionalist. I'm um, rambling. Uh, I don't know what the, I don't even know what the original question was. Uh, sorry. Oh, describing the tweets. So just one one last quick one. Uh, you know, about the one you may be refined to say, but I'm not. I wish all the West Bank settlers would go missing. Let, let me just say, you don't have to believe me. All right, you don't have to buy my explanation. I understand, but you, you cannot justify firing me based on an inference about what somebody means in a tweet. All right, the first thing that I teach uh, students, uh, I have one here, she can, she can uh, form one, she can, she, can, she can vouch for it, that authorial intent, intent is not a good way to, uh, you know, to, uh, to interpret a novel, all right? Uh, you know, or, or a tweet, 
in this case. So, well, he meant that he wanted them murdered or he wanted them uh, kidnapped. No, I didn't mean that, actually. I meant that I want them to go missing. Am I a shrinking violet on Twitter? I'm not passive aggressive. If I would have wanted them murdered or kidnapped, I would have said murdered or kidnapped, right? Uh, and, and when I say go missing, you, I, I wish you, you got to understand that there's, there's a long, long, long tradition of people who've been colonized wishing that their colonizers would go away. You might not like to hear it, but it's true. They don't like you. They don't want you there. Please read The Wretched of the Earth. And read what Franz Fanon has to say about what the, the native says about the settler. All right? Uh, that comes directly out, out of that framework. Think about the ghost dance in the 1890s, uh, in the lead up to the, um, to the, uh, to the uh, Wounded Knee Massacre, right? The ghost dance was, was, uh, was, a, was an articulation of, of the desire that, that all the settlers go away, right? And, and I don't like to uh, totalize based on, on ethnicity because I'm sure there are plenty of, of Palestinians and, and Arab Americans um, who disagree heartily with, with, with much of what I say, but I, I can't help but point out, uh, out all the feedback that I've received over the past three months <laughs> about uh, everything, right? I've been, I've been receiving a lot of feedback. Uh, you know, I've been, uh, that's, that's, uh, see how civil and diplomatic I can be, uh, you know. Uh, um, N not, not a single damn Palestinian or person of color has complained about that tweet. Not a single one. Right? Not a single one. It, it, it seems to be uh, uh, oriented in, in um, a, a discursive community or political community where uh, the very thought of not accepting the presence right? or, or, or the, the power of of the, the 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 colonizer is a sort of personal rejection that they simply cannot tolerate but it's one that that if if we're going to understand the situation clearly right we we need to confront the palestinians do not want israeli settlers on the west bank and we want them to go away all right <laughs> that's what that tweet was saying and I can understand why people reacted strongly to it, but uh, it's it's a sentiment that you will find on every single street corner, on every single village or city on the West Bank. So I want to um, move away from you and your case mm -hmm. and to try to get us to talk now, and I want to bring Catherine and both of you, but since Catherine has not been part of this so far, um, to contextualize this. What is, um, what is happening with academic freedom around the country? Mm -hmm. um, firstly, on the issue of Israel-Palestine. Let's start with that, but I think we want to move out from there. But let's start with that if you want to take a crack. Oh, what is happening with academic freedom? <laughs> um, I think there are, there are a couple ways to think about it. One is that we could talk specifically about the discussion of Israel-Palestine and campuses. And secondly, we can talk about how the way that universities are dealing with um, uh, the perceived controversy of talking about Israel-Palestine in the way we are here is a wedge for um, diminishing rich academic culture and robust um, and sometimes uncomfortable conversations in universities more generally. And it's part of a larger corporatization of the university, I think, that wants to banish from its... Um, uh, uh, life, intellectual life, um, discussion of issues that might offend funders of the university. Mm -hmm. So we can we can w open up the optic very broadly, or we could keep it quite specific. And I think in both instances, um, there's a lot to say. So um, uh, Stephen's case is important in its own terms, but it's not unique. Um, uh, uh, he and I got to know each other over the summer when um, I, I knew of your work, but I didn't know you before August 1st, <laughs> um, or 2nd, I guess it was. Um, uh, and a lot of attention has been given to his case, but he will be the first to admit that he is not alone in suffering um, a, a kind of retaliation, punishment, backlash, censorship, um, or a range of things um, for having a particular perspective 
um, on the question of uh, Israel's legitimate occupation of the West Bank or the complex issues of belonging, dispossession, and um, justice in, in the, the space that is Israel-Palestine. It's hard to think of another topic that we talk about in the academy that generates this degree of heat <laughs> and where the claim is made that you cannot say certain things. Mm -hmm. We're committed as academics and as students to thinking hard about hard things. And it so violates the very idea yeah. of the university to say that, the, um, that we might even talk critically about a state not about Jews, but about a state and the actions of a state. And we might think critically about the claims of belonging and dispossession of people who've been displaced by a state and suffer violence daily by that state, um, that somehow that is out of bounds in every instance. So that even the media that was circulating the last few days about this event seemed to already know what we were going to say. I didn't, I didn't know what we were going to say. <laughs> Um, and you had prejudged it, <laughs> that it was out of bounds. This is not the kind of conversation you can have in a university. And that is just wrong. It is just wrong. We can disagree. I'm sure there are people in this audience who disagree with some of the things that Stephen has said, and I haven't spoken long enough for you to disagree with things that I say, but I'm hoping <laughs> that you'll disagree with some of them. But that's what we do in the academy. We teach each other when we disagree. And we don't just pound the table, we make arguments, and we produce evidence, and we speak um, from a position of rigor, not from a position of ideology um, that, that needs not make an argument in its name. And so that's what's so frustrating and so horrifying about what's happened in Stephen's case, but not only his. Um, I've suffered much less um, violent and uh, uh, situations of censorship in my own campus. At Columbia, I often refer to Columbia Law School as Hebrew University on the Hudson. <laughs> we have an extremely close relationship with Hebrew U and with many of the universities in, in Israel. We have faculty and students exchanged constantly. And you don't hear Columbia Law School being criticized for only taking one side of the issue of Israel-Palestine. And often the people who come to the law school have very strong views um, on the justice of the Israeli state. Um, but we don't get criticized for having people who have a particular viewpoint and make arguments about it. It's only when you have a viewpoint that's more like Stevens that you're seen as biased. So how does bias surface? With what are the circumstances in which bias surfaces? And um, rather than reasoned scholarship, careful scholarship, that makes a particular argument that makes some people uncomfortable. So that's the beginning of an answer about what, it, what this is all about. I want to get Stephen in on this, but I, 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 I did want to inject something that just this week at Brooklyn College, and some of you know this, we had another speaker, Katha Pollitt, was here speaking on mm -hmm. abortion rights. And whereas whenever the issue of Israel-Palestine comes up, there's the question that you just said of bias. You have to have both sides. That's always the first thing. You have to have both sides. And it was brought up by certain departments and certain faculty and administrators on, on, for, for tonight. Katha Pollack came, spoke by herself, and the title of her talk, which was about defending abortion rights, was pro. <laughs> Defending abortion rights. Pro. Not pro and con. You know, not let's consider, but, but just pro. And nobody said anything about it. It was just completely normal. And, you know, what strikes me about this is, you know, if we were in a state like Mississippi or Alabama where you can be sure the issue of abortion is far more contested. I mean, frankly, it's contested on our campus. I mean, many of our students are not necessarily in favor of reproductive rights. So, you know, it's, it's, it is fascinating to me just it, it's it's it the way this tag appears on that issue um but anyway i i just jumping in but oh you... no I, I i really don't have much to, to 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 add to what um you and catherine said uh i was at princeton a few days ago and there was an article in 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 the forward about uh, their recent uh move to 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 do divestment and one of the faculty members at at, at princeton is the the 
former um, uh, U.S. ambassador to um to to Israel. I, I can't re I can't remember his Kurtzer. name. Michael like Oren. Dan no, no Dan Kurtzer. Dan Kurtzer yeah. exactly. And he had a wonderful quote in that article after three paragraphs of of disparaging the divestment resolution. He 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 says that I just don't think it's productive to take sides at this moment. You see, and that 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 could only. That could only happen in the the context of 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 one geography automatically uh, being conferred the status of civil, right? Uh, and another uh, geography automatically being conferred the status of savage or barbaric or or backwards, right? That see, when you take the side of the state or when you take the side of state power. You're not taking a side. Right? You're defaulting to the norm. It's when you take the side of anything in opposition to state power that you're taking sides. That's when you become biased, right? That's when you when that's when you become uh, uh, non-objective or, or you know whatever other uh, you know platitude that, that they pull out. So you you know you you can take um, Israel's side and and then uh, proclaim that you haven't taken a side at all based on a certain sort of, of logic that taking Israel's side is the natural and normal thing to do, right? And I think these, these phenomena sort, sort of speak to that, right? You know, and, and, you know, as to the idea of pro and con and, and, and you know, balance, you know, that there's always a sense that, that you know, a, a pro-Palestine speaker, right, you know, needs a, a, a pro Israel speaker alongside her or alongside him for the sake of, of balance, um, that ain't balance. That's oversight, right? That's oversight. They don't want a pro-Israel speaker alongside him, right, or alongside her. They want a pro-Israel speaker there to invalidate him and to make sure that, that, that uh, he, he doesn't get uh, a little too, uh, you know, excitable or out of hand in, in his condemnations of, of, of Israel. There's got to be somebody there to, uh, to sniff around the perimeters and, 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 and make sure that, that things don't get too uncivil. Um, I want to ask you a little bit. Of, you both, you, you've used the language of civility, and I want to get to that in a minute. But I, I, I wonder, though, if we could, you could both of you think about, it seems like there's just, uh, impressionistically, there's more and more of these cases that are cropping up in the last couple of years. So A, I don't know if that's true or not, so if you could speak to that, and B, if it is true, uh, why? What's, what's, why? Why more of these academic freedom cases around this issue now as opposed to 19, you know, 90s or the 2000 aughts or whatever we call that? So. There are an, an enormous number of cases, not um, exactly like Stevens, but um, this afternoon I was emailing with a faculty member at a Northeast uh, college in the Northeast who is pretty sure she's not going to get tenure. She's of Palestinian descent because she invited a speaker. She was the co-sponsor with SJP of a speaker who offered views that were critical of the state of Israel and of the occupation. And because of that, she was a junior faculty member, didn't speak at the event, just attended it and mm -hmm you know, facilitated the invitation, um, uh, her, her tenure committee has decided not to recommend her for tenure um, because she's creating a, um, a, a hostile environment for students in the college that, in which she teaches. Other faculty have been denied research grants um, for, for work that they do in Israel-Palestine um, if those projects are not um, ones that have a particularly positively pro-Zionist um, agenda embedded in them. And when they come back from that work, uh, the research for which they said that they were going to promise to do while they were there is very closely examined to make sure that the work actually conformed to what they, the research proposal embodied. And I can tell you, almost always when you start research, it ends up being quite different from what you thought you'd get into. You don't know what you're going to find. And you would be doing a bad job as a researcher when whatever field you were, if you just stuck to whatever your hypothesis was before, before you started the work. But in this particular area, there's a, um, a, a kind of gotcha way in which um, universities are trying to catch people 
um, in technical violations of not doing the work they promised to do because their research took them elsewhere, at which point they have to um, reimburse the university and pay a fine oh. um, uh, for, for, their, for their research. Um, just on the sort of mundane level, when I returned from um, the West Bank a couple of years ago, I wanted to do a talk at the law school about the work I was doing with women lawyers in Ramallah. Um, and uh, the title of the talk was um, uh, The View from, from Palestine, Women Lawyers and uh, something like that. And I was told by the dean's office, you can't have an event with the word Palestine in it because there's no such thing as Palestine. And I thought, well, Tibet. I mean, we could start with a list of places. Um, even if you agreed that there's no such thing as Palestine or that, they, that, that as, a, as a political concept it's in play, um, we have events all the time around um, real and imagined states. Um, um, but why would that matter? So I went ahead and had the event anyway. Um, and then a number of us have to have security, university security, at our offices because we've endorsed the uh, cultural and academic boycott. Um, shortly after I did, a few years ago, um, people actually showed up at my office to yell at me. Yeesh. Never mind email and um, the, other, the other ways in which I've been attacked. Um, uh, and, and that's not something I'm doing as part of my academic work. It's something I'm doing as a person. Um, but there, I can give you countless examples of um, faculty who've been um, punished for expressing views, doing research, helping out students, um, even inviting someone to speak at their college, um, because the view, those views challenge a particular view of political Zionism. Um, why is this happening more? Partly, I think, because the BDS movement is gaining steam. And I think people are worried about that. Um, we're seeing a larger, certainly far less than a consensus, but a larger body of people internationally who are kind of questioning um, the legitimacy of the occupation and thinking hard about the rightness of the claims of Palestinians in response to the violence and, and, uh, and uh, uh, occupation they suffer. Um, uh, and because of that, there's been a very well-financed, very well-organized movement to punish academics who speak on this issue. There are projects funded in Boston, in California, and around the country whose only mission, only mission, is to censor speech critical of Israel on campuses. It says it in their mission statements. Mm -hmm. And they're well funded. They have campus um, uh, outposts of students whose job this is to come um, to lectures like this, record them, and then punish us later for it. I teach classes where I have plants in every one of my classes who want to know what I'm saying. Um, all of our events are monitored by these groups. It feels a little like the 50s in a way of being um, um, monitored for what you say because you know you will pay a price for it. But the, it's not accidental that this stuff is coming up now in the way it is. There's a very well organized movement uh, and institutions and organizations that that is their job to make trouble for those of us who speak in, um, uh, uh, in ways that are critical of, the, of, of a certain form of political Zionism. Um, I, I, I agree with what, um, what Catherine has said. Um, we, we could probably think of, of lots of, of legitimate reasons why um, um, you know, this, these acts of oppression, you know, or sup re repression, excuse me, appear to be on the rise. Uh, one of the, the one of the most interesting of those reasons uh, to to me uh, builds off of what Catherine is saying. I, I believe that uh, I believe that it's becoming increasingly difficult to defend Israel, and as it becomes more and more difficult to defend Israel, you know, it becomes uh, more necessary to shut the criticism down altogether or not even have the debate or the conversation or the discussion in the first place. And I think back to the, um, to the uh, discourse um, around the, the ASA boycott debate, you know, and that went on for a while. There were really a lot of people, you know, um, you know sharing their opinions on that matter, throwing their hat into the, into the debate. And um, it, 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 it struck me after a while that uh, we were we were no longer arguing about whether Israel does bad things. We were arguing about whether boycott, academic boycott, is an appropriate response to those bad things, right? And we were arguing about 
academic freedom as an abstract principle and whether it's ever justified, right? So people weren't saying, people against the boycott weren't saying, you know, what you're saying about Israel is, is, is ludicrous and completely untrue and unfounded. They were just saying, you know, well, other countries are shitty too. Uh, you know, um, other countries are violent too. Uh, you know, other places do bad things or we're against boycott on principle. And while you're at it, quit singling out Israel, right? Um, you know, and then they were really, uh, you know, they were basically, I don't know, it was, it was, it was a weird moment, but the, the, the argument was largely, you know, we're, 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 we oppose academic boycotts, so why don't you go and boycott North Korean universities? You know, that was, was kind of the, uh, the, the, the argument. Uh, and then... Uh, even in, in Operation Protective Edge, I saw the same phenomenon play out in, in rationalizations for, for Israel's behavior, right? No, very few people were denying that, that Israel was killing people by the dozen or, or by the hundred. Nobody was denying that Israel was, was killing uh, babies and, and, and children by, by the hundred. Nobody was denying that Israel was uh, blowing up hospitals and... UN shelters and, and schools, right? Or very few people were denying these things. They were simply blaming it on the Palestinians. They're saying it's the Palestinians' fault. You know, Hamas, um, specifically, it's Hamas's fault, or the Palestinians are making us do it, right? Which is a reboot of a very, very, very old colonial idea that the heart of the colonizer was innocent and pure until he encountered the native, at which point he became corrupt. Right, and and he was forced into acts of violence against his uh, his, his 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 better disposition. Right, hell, that's the entire thesis of of like Munich. You know, the Steven the Steven Spielberg film. Right, like you know, we 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 Jews were such a innocent people. Right, and until uh, until we had to deal with these Palestinians, and now they're making us do all kinds of horrible things to them, and my soul is anguished as a result. Right, and and so it's a reboot of 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 a very old idea of of the native having a corrupting influence on on the inherent goodness of 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 the colonizer. But again, there's there's no denial of the war crimes. Right, there is an argument about who is responsible for the war crimes. So again, the, the the it seems to me that the arguments change, and it's very difficult to to uh, to defend Israel on the grounds of 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 policy, right, or or even on the grounds of of ideology as the Israeli government moves further and further to the right, right, and people like uh, Lieberman, right, uh, keep spouting off more and more insanely racist. Uh, Proposition. So I think that in, in part, right, I think there are a lot of reasons for the increase, but one of them to me is, it, it seems to me that, that, uh, that, that in, instead of, of defending Israel, a lot of people would just rather not hear criticism of Israel in the first place. So in the interest of time, I'm going to just ask one more question, and then we're going to open up to the audience. Um, but I'm going to do a two-parter to try to get as much in as I can. But I'm going to ask both of you to try to be brief as possible. Um, uh -oh. It's uh, <laughs> it, 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 Catherine, you earlier when you talked about academic freedom, you, you know, you said this is what we do in academia. We present arguments with rigor and evidence. And I think one of the issues that came up um, and the counter that I added says that's fine. But if that's what we're protecting, why should we protect tweets? Why should we protect what a faculty person is doing on Twitter, which is not necessarily about our rigor and evidence, but something else? So I wanted to ask you, why, does, why should academic freedom, both of you, in, include these kind of extramural statements? Why mm -hmm. should it? Why shouldn't it protect this? But you know that, if you're going to do that, forget it. Mm -hmm. So that's the first part. And, it, and the second part is related to this which is the civility issue, which has come up a lot. And you joked earlier, Stephen, you said, see, I can be civil. So why shouldn't we be civil? If you can be civil, why shouldn't we always be civil? What's, mm -hmm. Why shouldn't we be civil? Mm -hmm. what's, so wrong about, what's so wrong about civility? Okay. So, uh, and then we'll open it up to everybody. Well, thank you so much for that question. <laughs> I'm being civil. 
You did it very well. <laughs> well. I'm from the Midwest, and we're nice to people there. We don't say mean things to their face the way New Yorkers do. <laughs> we just wait till they leave the room. <laughs> and then we're kind of sarcastic. Um, so, if I, those are big questions, and I don't know how to be so brief, but I'll be, I will be brief, because I'm really curious to hear what the rest of the, you in this community feel about these issues. But... Civility is civility was the uh, was the charge against Stephen that the chancellor relied on in saying we're not I'm not going to take your appointment to the the board of, of trustees uh, because what you said in your tweets was uh, problematic not in its substance but in its tone and it created they believed a hostile learning environment for certain students at the University of Illinois and rendered you unsuitable as a professor by virtue of your temperament, not your ideas. So one question is in what role was he tweeting? Once a professor, always a professor? Do we not enjoy a private identity or an identity that is larger than our role as a professor? That, that's one set of questions we might ask. Um, uh, when we are our sexual selves, when we are our political selves, when we are re our religious selves, when we're praying, are we doing so as professors? Mm. Um, and does what we do in those contexts cast a shadow on our classroom identities? I think not. So I do think, um, I don't want to invoke a public-private distinction because feminists have done a very good job, um, I believe, of, <laughs> of taking that distinction apart. But I do want to ask, uh, encourage us to think critically about um, uh, what we're doing when we're tweeting. If I'm in class tweeting about the class, okay, um, but I don't think you were acting as a professor in your own mind um, uh, when you were tweeting. And at the same time, I do think, um, by virtue of our privilege of being faculty, it enables us to do certain things politically outside the classroom. Um, so there is a, a, a porous relationship between these roles as private citizen, as person engaged in a political a set of political hard political questions, um, uh, and as a professor. And I and I don't think there's an, a clear answer to that question. But the civility one is easy. <laughs> civility, and I've said this elsewhere, and and I've said it more uncivilly, <laughs> is not an academic norm. If we purge from the university outrage, anger, I get angry in my classes. My students get angry. They read a book that I give them that I don't agree with, but I'm giving it to them in order to provoke them. Um, and then we talk about it. That's what we do in universities. So to say that the only holding environment for learning is one that is constructed around a norm of civility grossly misstates what it means to think hard about hard things. And if I'm not, if we're not generating emotional reactions to the things we're thinking about that might it sometimes be understood as uncivil, then there's something wrong. We've, we've thinned out the educational enterprise. And I do want to just mention one, I have so many things to say about civility, but I just want to say one local thing. And I'm curious, is this diverse viewpoint statement, is it something that's always read before student events? Yes. yes. It is? Okay. So that's interesting, um, because part of what it said was that um, uh, being tolerant of diverse viewpoints and the sort of values that it was invoking were important for career success. And I think part of the civility norm is about training students to be certain kinds of citizens who don't make trouble later, and certain types of workers who don't take on management or don't take on authority in the workplace. So learning how to encounter things that upset you and respond in a civil way relates to your career success in ways that I find very troubling. So. Um, the university is a space that should be thought of not as an extension of our childhoods or your childhoods, you students, and I think this, the turn to trigger warnings and civility and some of what we're talking about tonight in a way imagines the students in college and in graduate school as sort of in an elongated childhood for which mm -hmm. we are their parents in a way 
taking care of them, learning how to t teaching them not to bite and hit one another and <laughs> things like that. But the, uh, the alternative thought that's at work here around the university is that it is, it is training for career most importantly. That's new, that we're training you for a particular form of market activity later. Um, it used to be that this was the place where you did stuff that didn't necessarily cash out later, but that enriched you as a person who will go on to do who knows what. I never thought I would be a law professor, right? My younger me would have been horrified at the thought of it, <laughs> of me working at Columbia Law School. Now, just a horrible sellout bourgeois, terrible thing to do. But here I am, right? And the things I learned in college prepared me for a very complicated adult life that is in no way over, and who knows where it will go. Um, so to reduce the college experience to career training and professionalism drains the richness of a, of a, of a college or university education. Of, of, of the richness of thinking ideas and learning about unsolvable problems in complicated ways that we do in English departments and, and in law schools too. Um, and so I would just ask that if you, even if you do care about diversity of viewpoints, which I think we should, not because it's an instrumental value to getting a job later, um, but because it opens you up to something that may challenge what you believe is already settled in your own heart and mind. I, I, I have nothing useful to, to add to that. <laughs> so um, we're gonna. But before we open it up, we're gonna. Hello, my name is Colter Mahmoudi. I'm vice president of Students for Justice in Palestine. We will now start the Q and A portion of tonight's event. Each person will have two minutes to make a statement or ask a question on the floor. Five minutes will be allowed for responses from the speakers. When 30 second sign goes up, you will um, wrap up your question. Um, the time of sign will go up when your time is done. Due to time constraint, we ask that all speakers end when their time is up. All decisions made by the moderator should be respected. Everyone is asked to respect all other speakers and not interrupt while others are speaking. Priority speaking will be given to participants who have not yet spoken. I'll now hand it over to Professor Corey Robbins. Okay, so these are the ground rules that we are required by Brooklyn College to state. Um, but hopefully we can, I think the spirit of it is, a, is to have a, a genuine conversation and that's what we're gonna try to do here. So, uh, yes, oh, so I, I, there's actually, you gotta, you gotta line up there. There's a, oh, there's a line. There's a line. <laughs> Speaking of extended, oh. elongated childhood. Uh, everybody line up against, yeah. Um, Anyway, uh, so uh, please identify yourself and, you know. Uh, Samir Chopra, philosophy. Stephen, I know these matters are subjudice, but I was wondering if you could say something about the specific legal issues that have arisen between you and the University of Illinois. I know that your legal team has already filed one lawsuit against the university. I can think of at least two more that you could file. <laughs> <laughs> I know you don't want to maybe give away your entire legal hand at this moment, but I think it would be really useful, I think also for the students to find out what the legal issues are, especially the First Amendment ones, and also what your options are going forward vis-a-vis -vis the university, if they hire you back, will you take it up, or they'll just stick their money they'll Okay, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, well, uh, we we uh, I, I just sued um, two, two or three days ago, sometime this week, for uh, you know for uh, to make the to, to force the university to comply with uh, FOIA requests because it's a matter of public interest that that um, you know that citizens and 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 taxpayers um, you know uh, have access to uh, uh, what perhaps went into uh, the university's decision because. Uh, you know, the, 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 the public concern factor of it, I think, is especially relevant because, um, especially for the people of Illinois, because, you know, the, the university has, uh, you know, it, it, it's experienced uh, severe damage to its, its reputation. Um, it's, it's at the center of, of, uh, of a nationwide um, controversy that, that uh, unbelievably hasn't um, slowed down for over three months and shows no signs of, of, of slowing down anytime in the near future. So, 
you know, it's 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 required by law to um to to release these documents, and and so I'm I'm hoping that that the the lawsuit will uh will will compel them to do it. Um, I I can't uh you know I I don't think it's it's not so much that I can't. I don't I don't feel uh, qualified to talk about um some of the uh. Uh, legal specificities of, of my case, but uh, you know the folks at the Center for Constitutional Rights, uh, one of the uh, uh, who are my co-counsel, um, you know, are, are usually uh, available and, and very eager to talk about the specific um, dynamics of of the case. Um, for 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 me, um, I'm mostly. I mean, my my, my first priority is is to be um, to be re reinstated to my job. You know, I signed a contract. The university signed a contract. I've upheld my end of that contract. I'm simply waiting for the university to uphold its end of the contract. Um, to me, it's no more complicated than that. But um, you know, I I I want us to us. I mean, any everybody who's been working in some way on this issue, not me, but us, those who are concerned about these issues of academic freedom and. Corporate governance and and uh, you know suppression of of, of uh, Palestinians and Palestine narratives. I, I want I want all of us to, to end up in a place where uh, the the university is is unable to set uh, precedent for for this decision. Um, no college or university president that that I'm aware of in the United States has. Um, has uh, criticized or, or condemned the administration's actions, right? And that tells us a lot about uh, where their rooting interests are, so to speak, right? Uh, you know, they're they're uh, you know they're they're, they're sort of uh, circling the wagons around uh, you know the extraordinary amount of increased power and authority that that this might provide them. And so, for me, um, uh, a sense of victory is, is that doesn't just have to do with the you know the the courtroom or or reinstatement, but uh, you know hel helping uh, to to create a uh, paradigm or a precedent in which uh, in which uh, this this sort of action will 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 become um, either verboten or extremely difficult to uh, to to carry out in the future. Okay, I you know I see a line developing, so what I'm going to do is take two questions at a time, and so. You can go with the next person, and then and then we'll get an answer. I have a comment to make. My name is Ira Wexler. I'm a lifelong resident of Brooklyn and a lifelong struggler for for uh, against imperialism, racism, and for communism. And uh, what I would like to say is that don't get caught up in the legalisms, my friend, because civility and legalisms go hand in hand. It's only the people's movement, the strength of the struggle, that it's going to save you. It, it, I can tell you from my own experience two years ago, after I was forced into retirement, when my bosses gave me a heart attack from struggling against their injustices at my hospital, that, uh, that I uh, was involved in the, in the struggle to help keep the Sunni downstate open. It's a racist attack by Cuomo and his Wall Street backers against the health care for the working class. And I was arrested as a peripheral part, just walking down the sidewalk because they wanted to make a, a, an example out of people for fighting back. And what saved my ass was my comrades and myself getting 200 hospital workers to sign petitions demanding that they drop the charges against me. It wasn't any lawyer who got me off. Word to the wise, and I'll tell you what I, we need to have outrage because I was uh, my my uh, my grandmother's uh, maternal grandmother's family was from Hungary, and they were uh, one million Hungarian Jews went to Auschwitz because of the Zionist leadership of the State of Israel. And uh, uh, Rupert Kastner, this is all documented. Rupert Kastner, the first Interior Minister on the Ben Gurion. Made a, made a deal uh, with Ben Gurion and the leadership of the Jewish uh, uh, the, the Jewish Council's committee uh, approval to negotiate with Eichmann for for the release of so your time, uh, fifteen your time is, your time is fifteen thousand Jews okay. uh, only Zionists he, okay. uh, Eichmann offered 
one million okay. for a few million dollars more, he refused. Okay. I'm going to have to ask you to stop. So that's Thank the value you. of life. The Zionists play, pay on you. you so could, could we shut off whatever beeps are going? Thank you. Um, <laughs> and then uh, the other thing I want to say before, I'm sorry, before you ask, is that there, I see there's, there's a, nothing against grown-ups and, uh, and, and non-students, but we don't have many students on the line. And I just, I, oh, so in the back. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, if, if, if people don't mind if we... Let some of the students go. Yeah, I think that would be. No, no, no. I didn't. I, I mean, you, go, you go ahead. But, but if we could get some of the students forward, that would be great. Thank you. My name is uh, Steve Bloom, and I think it's useful when we consider the difficulty we have explaining the parallel of settler colonialism in Palestine and in the United States to remember that that's a difficulty in this country. And in the rest of the world, people don't have any trouble understanding that. Uh, I, I had occasion to visit Northern Ireland some years ago, and I was struck by the fact that every place that I saw the Irish Republican flag hanging, I saw a Palestinian flag hanging side by side. It's not an accident that the uh, South Africans who struggled against apartheid instantly recognized the nature of Israeli apartheid, don't have any trouble with that. Um, and, and, and most of the world has a history of being the victims of colonialism. So the U.S., the, the official you know, reality in the United States is fighting a rear guard action on that question. And um, I think it gives us some perspective just to, to keep that in mind. Thank you. Do you guys uh, want to respond at all, or do we want to keep going with the Q&A? I have... I, I've, find nothing to uh, disagree with <laughs> or, 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 or to add to. It's so a good we'll comment. Take, we'll take two more questions now. Um, first off, good evening. My name is Jamal Henderson. I'm a proud political science major here at Brooklyn College. And my question is, do you feel that the current situation, uh, this for both academically, in regards to the state between Israel and Palestine, has the same effect, if any, between the internal state within the United States between African Americans and whites during the time of the struggle to get particular academic studies on universities across the country, do you feel it's still taking effect or do you feel like there's any difference? That's my question. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, then, uh, we're gonna take one more and then- Oh, yeah. oh okay. And I appreciated the uh, conciseness of that. <laughs> uh, so. oh, hi, Mr. Slider, my name is Michelle. So I'm just going to quote something you said. I'm not contesting your right to speak here today. I think you have every right to speak here. But I'm just going to quote something you said on one of your tweets. I think of all the pain Israelis have caused, their smugness, their greed, their violence, and yet I smile because it's only temporary. You didn't mention settlements, settlers here. You just mentioned Israelis as a whole. And so this statement, you were talking about me, my family, my friends, my people, the people of Israel, people who I love. You never met me, but in, my, in your eyes, I'm greedy, I'm smug, I'm violent, I'm all these terrible things, and you don't even know who I am. You even managed to connect it to greed, which is the, I'm not saying you're anti-Semitic, but which is the classic anti-Semitic stereotype, greed and Jews. And you also said that we're only a temporary people in the state of Israel, and I found that offensive. But my question really here today is for, uh, Professor Robbins, because I do think you have the right to be here. I think you are allowed to speak. I think is academic freedom. My question is, um, so Mr. Robbins, we've spoken before, Michelle Carvello, um, do you think it's appropriate for you, a head of, a, head of a department, representing a, a whole department on campus, to champion a speaker who speaks such hateful and insightful things about, about me, about my nation, about people who I love and who I see every day, would you support a speaker who said these sorts of things about Palestinians, blacks, gays, and any other groups in the name of speech and the name of academic freedom? Would you support bringing someone like that to our campus? Um, do you guys want to uh, speak first in response to both questions, or, or had to? I'm, I, no, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid this gentleman's question is going to get lost in our reactions to the second question, so maybe we, we can... Okay. Um, 
could, could you give me a recap of, of your yeah. question? I'm sorry. I'm, I, I apologize. I, um, this always happens to me. Yes, the question was, do you feel that the current situation in regards to the state academically between universities, between Israel and Palestine, has the same effect, if any, between the eternal state, between African Americans and whites during the time of the struggle and present to get particular academic studies on universities across the country? Okay. Um, do you want me to, to, to sort of attempt an answer first on that one? Okay. And, um, well, it's, you know, it's a really good question. It's a, it's, it's, it's a difficult question because it, it covers a lot of ground. And um, I, don't, I don't feel completely qualified to, to, uh, to stand on some of that ground, but I'll, I'll try my best. Uh, I'm very aware that, that, that I have, um, you know, cer certain, um, certain uh, knowledge and disciplinary limitations. But, um, you know, if, if you're sort of talking about a, a, a type of, uh, you know, a, 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 a type of uh, majoritarian white violence, uh, you know, directed historically and contemporaneously against, uh, um, a, a, against uh, a minority uh, ethnic group, uh, African Americans, right, then um, I think that there are ways in, in, in which it, it, it has and does resemble the, um, the uh, you know, the, the, the I guess, uh, Zionist occupation of, of Palestine and the interaction of, of, of Palestinians and, and, and Jews. But um, I, I think there are considerable differences also. The, the, the first considerable difference strikes me as, um, you know, the, the, the history of, of, of chattel slavery, right, and, and the, the, the history of, 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 of reconstruction and, 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 and sort of the, the presence of, of folks of African descent on the, the North American continent as, as, um, as a land that's distinctly not of their origin in terms of, of, of their actual histories and their imagination. All of those things, I think, uh, render, render the, the, render the case of, of, Black folks in the United States, um, you know, if if not unique, then um, then then certainly un, unusual and not of a, a same class as as the type of of inequalities that 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 uh, we see in Palestine. Some of the the similarities, though, um, I think arise around first of all Israel's role in um in 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 training and in some cases arming um you know the uh the the police forces that uh that in turn um end up uh practicing various forms of of brutality right against um against uh black people in the United States I think also um the very uh the 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 anxiety that that the the black body and bodies of black ideas continue to have in in the American imagination strike me as as belonging to the same broad uh, political class as as the uh, you know the the anxieties that the mere presence of of Palestinians can sort of evoke. Right in, in 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 the consciousness of of, of many Israelis, but um, I, I think outside of specific instances like um, you know what what's what's been happening and what continues to happen in in Ferguson versus what what happens in the West Bank and 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 Gaza, it's it's very difficult I think to to put forward uh, you know a, a scholarly comparison of the the two situations um, in 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 a way that that would be fully convincing. If that makes any sense. If I can add just very quickly, I think there's a, a similar relationship in which certain people are deemed to be out of place. Yeah. And by virtue of their being in the wrong place, they are out of order. And uh, I, I think of Trayvon Martin, um, but even before that, I think of the black children who were who were bused into the Little Rock schools. A uh, small number of, of African American children who the police and the governor of Arkansas deemed to be a threat to the white children because they were in the wrong place. 
and I think Palestinian people, uh, but Arabs more generally, um, are often seen as being in the wrong place and by virtue of that being out of order, that their very presence is a threat um, to certain ideas, but, but also to the, to the peace. And just to bring us back to civility, I think there's something always already uncivil that is um, people who are out of place um, and, and by, that, by, by virtue of where they are out of order. And I, and I think it's a productive um, connection that, that you could do good work on as a student here at Brooklyn College. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to respond to your question, but I, I want to make it clear to everybody two things. One is I'm speaking not as the chair of the political science department. I'm speaking as myself, and I think it's very important to make that claim. And then secondly, this is the only time I'm going to speak to this issue, because this panel is not about me, and it is not about what I think about Stephen Salida and what he said. So I will say it once, but then that's it. I'm not going to speak about this again. Um, I feel as a matter of both moral, political, and legal principle, and it's something that I've devoted a significant amount of my intellectual academic work to, that nobody should be penalized at their place of work for their political views and their political statements. And I don't care what those political statements are. If Stephen Salida had said these things about Palestinians, it would not change my position on that question. And I think it's just absolutely a fundamental principle that people should not be penalized at work for what they say politically, number one. But number two, I, I reject the premise of, of the statement. Um, I think Stephen has made it very clear, I, I may just think of an analogy, that if a Vietnamese person during the, Vietnamese war, uh, the Vietnam War said something about Americans and, and said the exact same thing, I, it, 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 would, it would seem like the obvious thing to say. It would not seem to me to be a problematic thing. And I think the, the I understand there's a personal connection for you, but I think the, the flip side of it is we're talking about a state and what it's, the state does and what its citizens do. And that's the reality. And so I don't, see, I think you want to see this as a form of hate speech. I don't see it, but frankly, Again, even if he had, even if I disagreed with it, the principle would still be absolutely the same for me. So. so. Can I ask you one question? Can I ask you one question? No. Uh, oh. so, so. Okay, so we have two more questions. Hi, my name is Hayim. I'm a med pre medical student here at Brooklyn College. Thank you for coming to speak. Um, my question is um, in the past, you said that uh, anybody who's supportive of Israel is a horrible human being. Um, how, how, in what way can these comments be taken out of context in what you mean? Uh, for example, uh, thousands of Jews left France this summer and, and Europe um, in fear of anti-Semitism. Just this week there was a firebombing at a sushi restaurant in Paris. Um, so my question to you is in what way does uh, anti-Zionist anti comments get uh, translated as anti-Semitic comments and um, in what way do you think you're responsible for that, uh, that sort of Thing okay. Um, um, just let me take the second question. Uh, oh, I forgot. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sure sorry. Yeah. Uh, Stanley Heller, the Struggle Video News. Um, first question is about civility. Uh, uh, for what uh, King Leopold of Belgium did to the uh, people in the Congo, Mark Twain proposed that Leopold be stuffed and put on a, a pyramid of skulls. And, and the question is, do you think someone as uncivil as Mark Twain could ever be hired at the University of <laughs> Illinois or Ch Champaign. Or Probably not. Second point is look at the tweets, become a follower. I've read hundreds of tweets and they are not hateful compared to the monstrous things that went on this summer. They were restrained. Third point, I want to know the good guys and the bad guys. Who stood up for principle? What organizations? Because I'm a member of the American Federation of Teachers for 40 years, and I don't think our union did. I contacted the National, Weingarten said nothing, uh, UFT, Mulgrew said nothing, the college division said nothing. I believe in Champaign-Urbana they did that local, of the non-tenured people took the position. Rutgers, but those two tiny islands in all of the AFT is pretty shameful. This is an organization with lots of college professors, and it should be standing up for academic freedom. 
All right. Um, uh, uh, thanks, Stanley. I'll I'll uh, get to that uh, um, to that comment after I, I address Haims. You tell me if if I'm uh, mischaracterizing your your words as I read back what I um what I remember you saying. You you said that I uh, uh, how can I justify uh, saying that supporters of Israel are horrible people people. In the context of how these things are misconstrued. Okay, but but I didn't um, I didn't say that anybody who um, is a supporter of Israel is a horrible person. Um, to, to my knowledge, I've never made um, such a statement or suggested it. I did say that uh, if you uh, support what Israel is in doing, I think this is the exact tweet. I'm not sure if you support what Israel is doing in Gaza right now, you're an awful human being. No, it's actually even if you're defending. It's even oh. a higher bar, actually. Okay. Yeah. If you're defending Israel right now, you're an awful human being. Okay. So I had the quote written. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, My apologies for misquoting. No, no, it's it's okay. But uh, you're you're um, there's there's no need for apology. But I mean, uh, this is uh, there there are two ways that that, that I think I can uh, that I would like to, to to respond to your 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 query, and and one is that. Um, this is a this is a a platform that uh, relies first and foremost on on rhetorical performance, and the entire uh, genre is is given to um, hyperbole in in argument. Although um, I I do believe that in the case of of the tweet that 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 Corey read back, it's not I, I you know I I wouldn't I mean you can read it any way you want to, but. Uh, um, Reading it as as a as an implication of of of, of people's moral decency or, or lack thereof is certainly one way to read it. But you could also read it in a more imaginative way as a way of saying that the evidence for Israel doing horrible things has become incontrovertible, right? That there's no excuse anymore to um you know that there's no excuse anymore to uh to to defend Israel's actions given the information to which we're all privy in in the moment but as to the 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 second point um uh, you know about uh, the you know the anti-semitic um incidents you you cite um quite frankly um I wouldn't implicate myself in a single damn one of them um you know I I I would uh I would uh I would, would would deeply stand against any form of of racial violence or any sort of of anti-Semitic violence, and I don't know that that uh, that there's is an, you know any uh, convincing causality between um, the 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 work of of anti-Zionism and the the practice of of anti-Semitism. In fact, I would I would. Uh, there are always um, exceptions, but it, it, it seems to me that, that on the whole, um, it's, uh, it's the Palestine solidarity community that, and Palestinians themselves that constantly go out of their way to make sure that we're making distinctions, right? And that, uh, and that uh, any proper, in my mind, any proper ethic or value that stands against Zionism must also necessarily stand against anti-Semitism or any other form of, of, of racism. Otherwise, to me, it's not the type of anti-Zionism that I would be associated with. So while I can imagine that there is, is somebody with an anti-Zionist point of view, right, who might also support anti-Semitic violence, that is somebody who, who I likewise would condemn and somebody that I would never, ever, ever ever consider um, a political comrade, somebody that I wouldn't want to be in, in political community with, because to me, um, you know, an anti-Zionism or, or, or being against um, um, anti-Zionism in, in, in philosophy or on, on principle is more than just a matter of, of opposing um, what the, the Israeli government does. It's, 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 it's a matter also of being in, in conversation with, with an entire range of, of decolonial and, and anti-racism, anti-sexism, um, um, 
politics. It's it's um it's a statement of 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 a particular sort of of political ethic, right? And and a political identity more more than than anything. But uh, I would uh, all I can tell you is that uh, any time that that I've had the misfortune to encounter or be in contact with somebody who's articulations of anti-Zionism uh, seem to transition explicitly or implicitly into any sort of endorsement of, of anti-Semitism, then, then I boot that person from my life. It's, it's, it's not the type of person that, that I want to be around. Okay. Two more questions. Um, my name is Susie Nathalie. I have introduced myself to you before, but I'll tell everyone else. I'm also an Arab-American English professor, and so... Um, you know, your story has been deeply moving to me uh, and a little bit terrifying. Um, I also, you know, try to put political theory and post-colonial critique into my study of English literature. Um, and, you know, I just want to say, as someone who's in a classroom a lot of the time, I'm really a lot more worried about folks who weren't outraged by the carnage in Gaza, who didn't have the heart or the humanism um, to get a little bit angry uh, being in classrooms. Um, so the tone of your, you know, of your tweets never bothered me um, at that particular moment in time, but I did actually have a little intellectual quibble, um, and uh, that is with your characterizations of Zionism, which to me seem a bit narrow. I'm deeply interested in concepts of the nation, and mm -hmm. there are lots of them out there, and I mm -hmm. think that they're older than we, we really realize, and so I was just hoping that maybe you could talk a little bit um, about your concepts of the nation and nationalism. Uh, you know, do you see Zionism as a form of nationalism? Do you see Palestinian nationalism as something worthwhile? Can you tell us what you think Zionism is, what you think the nation is, um, you know, and uh, how they work together? I mean, I don't know. I see a lot of different options out there and perhaps some interdependence and my time's up. So it's Shukran again. Have fun, thank you. I, I just uh, want to add two points of information to Catherine's uh, last comments about civility, and that has to do with the way in which the notion has entered uh, public discourse, and especially in the educational field. And I'm referring here to the corporate media, specifically the New York Times, which had two interesting articles, yesterday or the day before and today. Two days ago, there was a little story, very nice story, about a debate team in a high school. You saw it. And they, it was just a story. And a picture of a nice little boy of color, probably African-American boy, reading from his debate thing. And, but the headline was, Civilized Debate. That was the one thing. And then today, interestingly, in the business section, because you mentioned the corporate you know, corporatization of the university and the move toward careerism in teaching. Today, there was a story about students applying to universities and cleaning up their email addresses and cleaning up their social media because in their applications, these were being scrutinized. So I just want to say that when you said this is reminiscent of the 50s, which I hate to admit I remember, <laughs> you know, this is very reminiscent, and it's taking the form of self-censorship, which is almost the worst kind that there is. So just a comment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, Zionism, ethno-nationalism, the nation, nationalism. Um, I care far too deeply about you folks than to uh, uh, go down the path of, of, of uh, reflecting on these things um, because, you know, you know, presumably everybody's uh, dealt with enough hardship in their lives without having to, to, to listen to me ruminate. Um, these, are, these are very, you know, complex questions. So I'm going to try to give you what I hope is a satisfying answer, satisfying in the sense that, that it addresses the core of, of, of your question um, without, um, without uh, yeah, without turning into, you know, uh, Benedict Anderson. Um, you know, uh, it wouldn't be so bad. I guess, no, no, actually, yeah, that may, maybe, I, okay, uh, yeah. so, okay, everybody, uh, you know, bring out your pillows. Okay, okay. Uh, just, uh, um, 
I will cop to, uh, I will fess up to uh, sometimes um, deploying, especially on Twitter, the, the term Zionist in, in, in crude and rudimentary ways, you know. I, I think a, a, a lot of us end up doing that, and I do think it's important that, that we step back and uh, assess things and, and, and try to put forward uh, at least a termino terminological precision that others can engage and, and choose to challenge if they want to say, well, you're not thinking about it complexly enough or, you know, maybe think about it in, in, in this way and not that way. Uh, in, in my defense, in, you know, like in Israel's Dead Soul, um, I spend many pages uh, articulating what, what I see to be the different uh, iterations of, of, of Zionism. Do you know what I mean? And so I'm not going to blame it on, 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 on Twitter. I'm going to blame it on, on, on myself. You know, every... I, you know, everybody blames, well, it's Twitter, it's Twitter. It's like, look, you know, 140 characters is, is absolutely no excuse for not having uh, any reading comprehension. Do you know what I mean? Uh, it's just, you know, it's less of an excuse in, in lots of ways. But anyhow, um, you know, so, but I, I, I still, I see Zionism as a, a as in some iterations as a, a form of nationalism, but I see it primarily as a mode of ethno-nationalism. Right, um, and it's that the ethno nationalism of, of of Zionism that I reject from a moral and and philosophical point of view. I think there's an element of of or an ideology of nation building in some of the earlier versions of of Zionism, but it quickly gave way to and ended up losing out to a a, a vision of of Israel that was fundamentally statist, right, or, or focused on a state, right, and not on a national community right but on a nation state in in the in the european uh you know incarnation of of of, of the term um there are versions of palestinian ethno-nationalism that um that i likewise reject and and i try to make it a point to um reject all versions of 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 ethno-nationalism by ethno-nationalism by the way um i you know i i i mean uh you know a, a form of, of nationalism that, uh, you know, invokes the, the primacy of a particular group of, of people, which is usually uh, defined um, in, in arbitrary and problematic ways, right? Like, even the question of, of who is a Jew is a question that's been taken up by the state of Israel, and I don't want the state defining my um, religious identity. Do, you know what I mean? I, I, I don't, you know, and uh, so... so the, the, so the, 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 pro the problems of ethno-nationalism are that they, they never, in it never as an ideology or as a practice encompasses the, uh, the totality of the, the population with which it's either in contact or overseas, right? And in that sense, it's always fundamentally exclusive. And in its exclusions, it ends up relying on, on disparate uh, legal systems, uh, disparate access to rights and so forth and so on, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> of course. I just wanted to say one thing about the little the civility story in the paper the other day with these <laughs> kids from the city who were putting on little suit jackets and ties um, and going up to Hackley, which is a very elite private school in Westchester, and doing these debate Team things and you know there's a place for the debate club everywhere I think it's an interesting mannered way of talking about a topic and teaching kids students how to have a particular form of debate but if everything we did in the university was in that form I mean imagine it Agaben's um, bare life pro and against <laughs> Kant's categorical imperative for and against, you know, Conrad's heart of darkness, for and against. Can we be both? Yeah, right. Or, well, well, that's yeah, the that's thing, that's right. That's I mean, a, just the, it's a well. send-up, right? I could see us doing it as a parody. Um, so certain questions lend themselves to debate in that, that very stylized format. And um, certain, the skills that come out of that format are useful in certain parts of life. But so much of what we do in a university is, is neither of those. So. Yeah. so in the, uh, I'm worried about the time, and Stephen is going to have to get out of here and, and get into a car and go um, <laughs> at some point soon. So I'm going to take three questions, and then they'll answer, and then the last three, and I, I hope that will we'll get there. Um, so 
so I'm going to take each each of the three of you first. Um, but let's all everybody try to. Okay. Hi, I'm Ross Bichewski. I'm a retired political science professor from Hunter College in the Graduate Center, and um, I have a brief comment and a question. Well, uh, my comment is, goes back to Catherine's concept of the wedge and the mm -hmm. ways in which the debate about Israel and Palestine becomes a, becomes a wedge. And I would say not just for clamping down on academic freedom in universities, but also for tightening the security state. And I want to give an example. When we were in Puerto Rico this past week, and, trying, and when we succeeded in getting the, the statement supporting BDS and the academic boycott through the National Women's Studies Association, we did this. We, we were in a final business meeting, and we had collected around 790 petition signatures. And we wanted to hand them over to the officers of the organization. And one of the officers of the organization, they passed it. It went through. But she raised a point. She said, I'm worried about the legal liability of our organization. If you give us these petitions, if a circumstance arises, and we may be called on to hand them over. And we all were chilled. And we thought, yes, this is a security state that we're living in now, especially around Palestine. My question, you haven't talked very much about BDS, actually. Um, and I, I work with Community for Palestine, and I work with Jewish Voice for Peace. In our New York City Jewish Voice for Peace job, we're moving much more now in the direction of saying, we, as we, American taxpayers, our responsibility is to stop US funding of Israeli militarism. But that's the direction we all need to be going in. It's a moral responsibility. It's a political responsibility. How do you do it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The person behind you. We're going to do three questions. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah. I'm also a member of Students for Justice in Palestine. I want to thank everyone for speaking today. Um, first, there's a lot I want to say, um, but thank you um, for speaking about the question of civility, because I think you're right. It absolutely has nothing to do with um, academic inquiry and discourse. And, and actually, if, if ever I am uncivil, it's because I'm, I'm passionate about what I'm learning, and what I'm learning is evoking um, emotion in me. So I, I want to just put that out there. Um, and I, I also want to make a statement about a letter which I sent to you, um, Stephen, on, on Facebook, um, that Assemblyman Simbrowitz had written to President Gould, um, and, uh, and also Assemblyman Dov Hifkin has made similar statements. Um, Really, just how dare they make the association um, between the act that happened in the synagogue, the murders of those Jewish people during morning prayer, which is atrocious in and of itself, but how dare they associate tonight's event with that? And, and I think that's something that everyone in, in the campus community has to come out and condemn, that that is a straw man argument, that is a cowardly association to make, um, and, and really doesn't, doesn't belong. And, I've been on campus before when another professor at, from Brooklyn College, Christopher Peterson Overton, was dismissed for having um, critical pieces in his syllabus, um, you know, like authors like Ilan Pape speaking about criticizing the state of Israel, and, and he was fired. Um, so much I want to say, um, I think the something else that's anti-Semitic, that not the tweets that he put out there, but what's anti-Semitic is to assume that the Jewish identity is monolithic. That all, all all Jews think the same, and that there is that they're all Zionists, and I think that's absolutely wrong. And we need to break from that that uh, really bullshit, excuse me, criticism. Um, and and lastly, I, I have so many other things to say. Um, but if you see anyone with a badge, please come up and speak to us, um, so you can keep, learn more of events that we have in the future. Thank you. Oh dear, I'm just going to repeat what some other people have said very eloquently, but I, I think that we're living in an in a age when society is a going, undergoing a transformation from quantity into quality in a very fascist direction. One of those aspects is what's happening to academic freedom. I'm sitting next to a young man who just spent seven months in jail for protesting. Mm. We live in an era of mass incarceration as well as mass incineration by our government and our allies, uh, thinking of Gaza in particular. Um, militarization of the police, very much in league with being trained in Israel. 
And to me, um, I just want to add that I think all these very fascist tendencies are coming, they're really a symptom of capitalism and desperation when you have a country that's failing economically, that's losing out in worldwide competition, and we're facing endless war, not only just against ISIS and for oil in the Middle East, but probably against China. And so I want to reiterate what I think the very first speaker said was that it's a time when we have to think about building a mass movement. It has to be not just an error in democracy movement, but an anti-capitalist movement. And so the only question I'd like to ask uh, uh, Stephen is, could you tell us about all the people and groups who have come together to support you? Because I think that is a mass movement that's significant. Oh, okay, uh, thank you. Um, and and this, uh, this actually allows me, I think, to circle back to uh, Stanley's question, which, which uh, never quite got, got answered. Um, but the interesting thing about um, so some of the support is, is it, 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 it's brought together uh, people who haven't uh, always or even often been in, in harmony with one another politically. You know? So there's kind of a, a, a broad, very broad coalition that, that, that agrees I should be reinstatement, reinstated if not on, on much else, right? Uh, that, that, that kind of consists of, of liberals, radicals, and libertarians. Right, and uh, it's a, it's an interesting political cocktail. I think some classic um, conservatives too. Um, I think uh, uh, you know a, a lot of uh, labor unions have have um, you know have have sort of thrown their hat into the ring. But uh, some of the groups that the AAUP, that's the American Association of University Professors, has been very supportive. Um, the uh, Modern Language Association, which is is. I don't know. It's it's kind of the queen mother of of all um, scholarly associations. It's uh, they're the ones that the the well. They, I, I was gonna make a joke about handbooks, but I realized that students don't carry around reference manuals for citation manuals anymore, do they? Uh, okay. Anyway, uh, you know, just I need to update my uh, sense of humor. Uh, the American Historical Association. Um, actually, uh, Corey can. Yeah. Yeah, Corey. The AHA, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, Corey spearheaded an effort that resulted in, at this point, I think over 6,000 faculty members um, boycotting the, the, the university. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of been a remarkable outpouring, and it's, it's, actually, um, it's, it's actually helped me mend some, some political fences, you know, so to speak. Uh, there, there are some folks that, that I'd argued with in, in, in the past who, who were like, you know, Steve, this is, uh, this is BS. You got railroaded. Um, you got my support. And I, you know, said, you know, the, you know, this, 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 this bickering is, 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 is done. And sometimes it takes, um, it takes an issue so obvious, right? Sometimes, uh, so obvious and so egregious that, that it becomes sometimes easier to, 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 to put aside, uh, other differences and 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 focus on 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 what is is pretty easy to 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 recognize as as something of of an injustice but yeah the, the supports come from labor it's come from um scholarly groups uh scholarly associations uh individual academic departments from uh, uh, across the country and 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 even a good amount of of support from student groups both graduate and undergraduate but the uh, somebody ought to to list out the uh the 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 interesting coalitions that that have developed around this particular interest in um in in academic freedom CCR has on their website. Oh, okay. The CCR has it on their website. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Can I say one thing about BDS? Uh, very briefly, it's important to remember that BDS is a tactic. It's not its own politic. There are plenty of people who share a critique with some of us about um, uh, of the state of Israel who will not endorse BDS. And I think we ought to remain mindful to the fact that, that boycott sanctions and divestment can be useful in some ways and when it stops being useful we'll stop doing it and we ought to and when appropriate allow exemptions to a call for BDS which is what the South Africans did the ANC did as well 
um, when they made a call for, for boycott, di divestment, and sanctions. But I think there are some avenues, and this is, I know, a controversial position, but there's some avenues of our movements that are rigid about BDS and insist on it and use it as a litmus test. And I think that's to mistake a tactic for a politics that is, is much larger than that. Um, so I just, it's, it's important, and when it works, great, and when it stops working, let's try something else. No, I was saying that you were not on the line when I cut it off, so you can't really, you can't really say the same thing to the person behind you. I didn't say anything. I said one, two, three. I said the last three people on the line. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Thomas D'Angelis. I'm a Brooklyn College student, uh, also a member of Student for Justice in Palestine. I just want to say a quick thank you, everyone, who uh, spoke tonight. Thank you for coming to organize it, and also the Brooklyn College staff for Mr. who take their time out to make this happen, allow it to happen. I just want to say, as a student here, I'm so proud to be part of two of the, two of the departments co-sponsoring the event, Sociology and Puerto Rican and Latino Studies. However, I think it's disheartening that there are faculty and departments who are so opposed to co-sponsoring this event and having it on campus. The extent to which faculty members and departments here who do not want to support events such as this is striking, and says a lot about their commitment to the investment in maintaining colonial powers across the globe. It is also a concern that local politicians are opposed to events happening on our campus. I think it's important for students here to understand that this campus belongs to us more than it does to any city council member. Uh, this school, and again, this school will not be open otherwise, so that's, I mean, that's the reality of it. So we as students here really have so much more power than we think, and I think I just wanted to make that clear. So thank you. Thank you. Hey, um, my name is Moshe. I am on the executive board of the Ishmael Club, actually, so I'm from the other side. Um, I think once we're on the uh, train of reading statements from our phones, I'm going to do the same thing. Have some of my here, try to gather my thoughts. Um, so we were talking before about uh, nationalism and Judaism and Zionism as being, you know, these different ideas. Um, so not all Jews are the same, and many Jews are not religious. Many are, um, and not all the religious Jews do uh, do support the state of Israel. But even those Jews who do not support the modern state of Israel do pray three times a day for God to restore Israel as a Jewish country. And that is beneficial to society in terms of solving the anti-Semitic problem, and that is, that is beneficial because under a idealistic Jewish society, it would be open and democratic to all people. Um, now, I just want to point out also that in academic um, conversation, you don't really get to de de define how people perceive what you say. So what I'm saying now, people are going to take it and understand it however they want. When you talk about Zionism, you're talking about Jews because many Jews inherently identify with their prayers and their, and their Zionism. Uh, and the name Israel is not an accident. It comes from, it comes from Jewish you know, literature and, and Jewish history. Um, and if you're, you're going to say that Zionism is not related to Judaism, then you're kind of missing the other side's perception of the conflict. And then how do you expect to come to a resolution when all you're doing is you know, arguing with somebody? And this goes back to the civility conversation. Civility is not necessarily inherently a moral high ground or a moral absolute, but it's just a, a common sense way to get people to, to listen to you. If you're gonna if you're gonna yeah. tweet things like, you know, I wish all the sellers would go missing, people are just gonna look at you and say, Who the hell are you? Because it's not a nice way to talk and I don't you don't like when people talk to you like that, so why would you talk about somebody else like that? It just it's not it's not common sense, it's a dumb way to solve your problem. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. Okay, thanks. It's just the last question, yeah. All right. Hi, how are you? I'm a political science major. You don't look like a crazy guy to me. I'll be honest with you. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the, the argument happens, but I actually have a, a more distinct question to have is, uh, Professor Robin just denied this young woman's existence as a person, as an Israeli citizen, as a, as a person who, you know, Druze, Muslim, Jewish, whatever, you're denying their existence. So if you really want to have this debate, you're going to have the same room and the same people every time you go around. And look, I don't believe in the settlements. I, I think there should be a two-state solution. And, and you know, Professor Robbins is going to disagree with me on that. Some other people might disagree with me here on that. But I think we really need to look towards peace. And I think my generation needs uh, to build towards peace. So I know <laughs> the other question I had is, uh, how do we get to that end? I know that Bruce Rotner and Pat Quinn both endorsed the vote against you. At the, how did you feel about that? Okay. Um, thank you. I'll, I'll, I guess I'll start with the, um, the last question. Unfortunately, our, our time is, is, is winding down, so I don't, I don't want to end up uh, you know, uh, yammering into uh, in, infinity. Um, first of all, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I think that... that uh, it did. I think it did take uh, 
it takes a, a sort of courage to to uh, come speak in, in opposition to uh, you know to to uh, an invited guest when the the majority of the crowd is is obviously on on the guest side so I appreciate you coming and I appreciate you sharing your viewpoints and asking your questions or viewpoints that I tend not to um, to agree with but I I think they give us a basis at least for having uh, what might be a constructive conversation. Uh, I have, you know, dialogue, I'm, I'm not uh, such a fan of the connotations of, of, of that term, but, uh, you know, an actual uh, political conversation. Uh, to go back to uh, something uh, Moshe said, um, I, you know, Judaism predates Zionism by thousands of years, you know, and so in in the end, I, I understand. I do. I get. It. I understand that that uh, that that Zionism can be for some people a, a profound element of of their sense of of being Jewish. Right? Um, I understand that. Um, I understand that that Zionism can be um, can be seen uh, uh, as 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 a profound cultural obligation, but you know. I, I, it, it doesn't seem to me fair or 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 accurate, though, to to say that uh, because it it exists that way to some members of an ethnic or, or religious community, that can be invoked to 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 define um, you know the the entire ethnic or or religious community. Because I know you know I, I know enough people who who see opposition to Zionism as, as an essential part of, of their being Jewish right and and so in the end it's it's in the end it's a political ideology that that uh, that that has different uses for different people and for some some people it doesn't have any uses at all you know I, I imagine that there were, were, were at least some Jews around the world who, who don't give a damn one way or the other right I, I don't know if that's the case but uh, I'm making a guess here right I certainly know that there are Palestinians some Palestinians around the world who don't seem to give a damn one way or the other right uh, you know or, you know and, and so the the you know but the idea of, of, of an open and, and democratic society that that, that, that Moshe invoked uh, is really interesting to me. I actually think is a, is a is a really productive point of of engagement. See the question that 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 I would ask and 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 and, and that, that I want to think about in relation to that that comment, right? And it is a comment I've really not heard before, and it's a comment that 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 I find fascinating. I don't know that what what does it mean to have an open democrat and democratic society that still exists in the the framework of 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 a, a, a specifically Judaic pr political project is that is that is that even is that even possible right uh, what what you know and and if it's going to be really open and, and and democratic what 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 elements of Palestinian culture and, and history must it necessarily entail right so so these are these are sort of questions that 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 come up that that I think we need to to think about. Uh, I know that that uh, the the second speaker had asked me a, a question at the end, and I forgot it. We should probably try to close. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah uh, so Professor Robert, I, I think this is why he didn't want me to ask the question. Um, he denied that woman. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know what I mean. But he the, clearly denied that woman's existence as a, as a person, as Israelis. And you know, we can talk about Israel and Palestine, and you know, international law says that there should be two states, and I, I get it that you guys are trying to posture and say that you know, you're great social justice warriors and this and that and that. Um, how, how do you transcend that movement where he doesn't go off the rails and puts people like me in the middle who don't want settlement, who want a two-state solution, who want a Palestinian and an Israeli state to have a peace? Or people just standing against you just because of the common sense of the all right, you, 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 you know what, excuse me, you've had a second chance now to ask your question, so. Oh, sorry, my, my bad. I it is your bad, this. actually. You can either respond quickly if you want to, but uh, it's, you know. Okay. Um, I, I appreciate the, 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 the comment and the question is, is worth um, I, I, ex exploring, but uh, I, I just, I have to say, though, that I'm, as a general political rule, unimpressed and 
unmoved by statements of political policy that include the word me. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's kind of all I have to say. You know. okay. So um, we're gonna, the last word is going to go to uh, SJP. And, but before we do that, I, I really, this is now the third, fourth, fifth event that SJP has uh, organized and uh, I think has enriched our campus, but also enriched the community. And I think it's, uh, it's not just a moral issue. I mean, there's a lot of work that goes into the kind, this kind of stuff. And I, I just think, um, and a lot of red tape, as I've discovered. Uh, and I, I think they deserve a round of applause for uh, bringing this to the campus. So. Um, so I'd like to just thank everyone, um, our speakers, everyone who's attended. Um, and, you know, if you'd like to keep up with updates from SJP, um, our website is brooklynsjp.com. We also have a Facebook page, so if you'd like to become more involved, if you'd like to just keep up with our events, um, you can like us on Facebook or visit our website. Um, and other than that, I'd like to thank you all um, and have a good evening. I'm not sure if there's still some refreshments or not. It looks like it's empty. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so thank you all um, for attending. Thank you, speaker. Uh, thank you, everybody. And unfortunately, um, Catherine and I have to run, so we're not going to be able to to chat. chit chat. Yeah. Thanks for everything again. Thank you. The thank event, you. for everything in general. I have to tell you, we have to open up the whole notion of semitism and anti-semitism.